Uh, all right, it is uh, January 24th. This is week two of engineering ethics at NGIT. I'm Dan Estrada, I'm your instructor, um, and welcome to class. Uh, okay, let's, let's see, I've got a couple of things to talk about with the course. Let's jump into the course right now. Okay, oops, 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 oops. Uh, all right, so we're on lesson two. Um, last week we did lesson one, we're on lesson two now. Um, remember you had a post due uh, on Friday of last week. Um, uh, if you've just registered for the course, uh, I've gotten a lot of emails from students saying they just registered for the course. Uh, what do I do about the old assignments? Um, I, uh, if you send me an email saying that you just registered for the course, I will not mark you late for the first post. Um, I do expect you to do the replies due tonight um, because the replies just require you know reading other people in the forum and that's what you should be doing anyway. So uh, do the replies tonight, um, but your first post in your introduction won't be marked late. Um, so if you just register for the course, uh, send me an email, let me know, and I will uh, uh, grade those without being marked down. Um, uh, just really quickly on the course, I changed, so it, it used to be the case that you had to scroll down this first page, 15 lessons to get to the very bottom. Uh, I got some students telling me that they didn't like that very much. So I've changed it a little bit. So now it's on a one lesson per page deal. So if you go to navigation bar, you can click on an individual lesson and it'll just take you to that single lesson uh, with, all, with all the discussion forums and stuff at the bottom. Now, this can be a little bit confusing because if you don't go to a specific lesson and you just go to the main page and you scroll down the main page, uh, having it in the daily format like that takes away the discussion forum. So if you go to the bottom here, you don't, there's no discussion forum. Um, uh, wait, is that true? Oh no, here, here it is. Yeah, so... Um, so, so be careful about this. Uh, I'll say that you can always find the activities from this tab at the top, the activities tab. So you can go directly to the discussion forum one or attendance, uh, the attendance grades from number one or you know, the second quiz or whatever. You can always get that from up here. You can also, um, in the navigation bar, and sometimes on some of your things, the navigation bar might be on the side directly. Uh, you can put it away. So uh, navigation bar, if you just click on the particular lesson, um, it'll take you the introduction will still show up at the top, but then it'll take you that particular lesson. Uh, good. Uh, scrolling through these. Um, let me tell you a little bit about grades. So I, I give the official grading policy in this grading video uh, at the top of uh, the course. Um, the grading policy also has a slideshow here. Uh, actually, let me open this. Let me see if I just go to the syllabus. Yeah, so, okay, so in the syllabus, it has a, uh, a bit about grade cal calculation. So every week is worth 100 points. Um, that's 20 points for a quiz and 80 points for a discussion. Um, now, usually, in, in most weeks, the, the quiz is separate from the discussion. So what you'll see on your grades is that uh, the discussion is worth 80 points, um, and the quiz is worth uh, 20 points, and that's, those are two separate grades. Now, the discussion is worth... 80 points, and that includes all your work in the discussion. So that includes your post, uh, which is worth 50 points, um, and your replies, which are worth 15 points each uh, for a total of 30 points. So 15, 30 is 80. That's your total discussion grade. <clears throat> Professor, um, yeah. just a quick question. For the post and the replies, um, are you going to be grading us? Like, for example, like if, you, if, you, if we clearly reach the, uh, the, you know, the word count uh, and you see that we obviously read the... Um, the readings, uh, are you going to take into account like uh, opinions and whatnot? Like are you going to, get, or are you just going to give the grade of completion? Like he read the assignment, you know, he, you know, he reached the word count or do you give partial credit for some replies if they're right, wrong, different opinions and whatnot? Uh, yeah. So uh, again, I go over this in a lot more detail in the grading video where, where I talk about um, what my policy is on uh, content versus quality of post and so on. Um, but the, the simple thing, to say is first, you're not graded on the content. Um, I don't. I don't care what your beliefs are. What I care about is that you put some effort into articulating them and getting into a discussion. So 
Uh, you can disagree with me. You can have beliefs I, I strongly disagree with. Uh, that's, that's all fine. I'm not grading you on the content of what you say. What I'm grading you on is how much effort you put into uh, thinking through what your thoughts actually are um, and then expressing that well on the discussion forum and then in a way that generates some discussion back and forth. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter. Your word count is not the important thing. Um, I give the word count uh, as an indicator of how much effort I'm expecting you to put into the work, but it's possible that you are under the word count but you do a really good job in your essay and you earn full credit. Um, it's also possible that you go over the word count, uh, but it's, it's really a lot of nothing and you just repeat yourself over and over and you're not saying very much, uh, and in which case you're going to get below full credit. Um, so uh, it's really about how much effort are you putting in. And when I talk about effort, and I, and I go over this again in the syllabus uh, in, in some detail, um, so the way I grade uh, so, so uh, first thing to say is, uh, because all of your grades are put together in the Moodle discussion, it's 80 points. Um, if, you, if you earned 40 points on your essay, uh, 40 points out of 50 points is a B, right? So that's a, it's a decent grade. But on Moodle, it'll show 40 out of 80 points, which is 50%, which is an F. And that has been scaring a couple of uh, students. I've been getting some panicked emails. You know, why did I get an F on this essay? I didn't. I thought I did well. Well, you didn't actually get enough in the essay. Remember, your uh, grade is out of 50 points. And you can check what your grade is by looking in the discussion forum. Uh, right now, I have the uh, grades off, so you can't see them for the, for the video. But um, down here next to your reply, you'll see something that says ratings, and then there'll be a number next to it, or your rating. And that rating is your grade. So, I, so the way I grade is I go through and I rate each post. Uh, the rating is out of 50 points, and so you can see what grade you got as the rating below your post. No one else can see that rating, only you can see that rating. Um, so don't worry about it being uh, public. Um, and then once you have that rating, so if you got 40 out of 50 points or 45 out of 50 points, you can go into the syllabus and see what that, what that means. Um, and, and so, again, the, the key thing to remember here is that it's, it's depth of, of uh, engagement. So uh, if you show me that you've not just that you, you know, quoted something from the article, but you're actually thinking about what the article's saying and that you're actually having your own thoughts in response to that article. Right? These are the kinds of things when I'm reading your essay will get you uh, an A-level grade between 45 and 50 points. Um, not only how deep are you going in a single article, but are you connecting uh, more than one article? Um, so, uh, sometimes uh, students do a pretty good job on a single article, um, but really hasn't incorporated the entire lesson, they've just sort of talked about that one article. That's fine. If you talk about one article, well, right, that meets the minimum requirements. Minimum requirements gets uh, 40, 40 or 50 points. So uh, this is what I mean when, my, when I say my grading's harsh. I don't, I'm not a stickler for rules, but the, uh, uh, and I'm not making sure that you agree with me or anything like that. Um, when I say my grading's harsh, what I mean is that I set up the rubric so that if you meet the minimum requirements, if you just do the minimum that's required of you, you're going to get a B in the class, you're going to get an 80% in the class. Uh, most people come into this class wanting better than an 80%. And I mean, 80% is right at the bottom level of a B, right? So if you are doing 80%, but you miss a couple of assignments, then that puts you in the C range. Um, so just doing the minimum work required will get you a B, you know, maybe a C plus. Uh, and because most students want to do better than that, then they have to put in more work than just the minimum requirements. Um, is there a question? So, for for example, um, like I, uh, for for my post, uh, I, I I I don't mind sharing my grade. I got a summer rating forty four. Is that forty four out of the fifty? Yeah, or that's, is that... 40, that's right. It's forty four out of fifty. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, so, the, so the way I'm, so just so you know how I'm thinking about this, a 44 out of 50, um, it goes a little bit beyond the minimum requirements. There's a little bit more depth than the, the bare minimum. Uh, um, and for, for the most parts when I was grading and putting 44, it was because they don't, uh, you'd only talked about one, one of the articles in, in the reading. So a 44 when I was grading, and I, I think I did most of the grading this weekend. Uh, so, uh, uh if you got a 44, my thinking here was that you did a good job on one article and you would have gotten a 45 or higher if you had connected what you said with this one article to one of the other readings in the lesson or you know, maybe some broader theme. Uh, also, if you had done independent research, so if you had 
what you said about this one article, and then you had some independent research that you brought in, you know, another article that wasn't in the readings um, that you wanted to relate to the lesson theme. That would have also pushed you above the 44 and into the A range. Um, uh, one thing, so it's not just a matter of talking about two of the articles, though. It's, it's a matter of the depth of engagement. So if you say, here's what I think about this one article, and here's what I think about this other article, and they're totally disconnected, um, that also is sort of B-range work. But if you, here's what's going on in this one article, and here's how it connects to this theme in this other article, and here's the, the larger lesson to gain from the whole, the whole lesson, uh, that's the kind of thing that moves you into the A-range. Um, hopefully this is explaining how my grading works. Uh, most people were getting in the A range, the high B range. Um, C level work was really for people turning in work late um, uh, or going way, way under the word count, like around 200 words or so. Okay, so uh, you have a rating at the bottom of your post out of 50 points. And then under each of your replies, we'll also have a rating out of 30 points. Um, and uh, I, I'm being less critical of the replies, um, uh, but um, I'm, I'm still here looking for a depth of engagement. So when you add all those points together, you'll get your total discussion out of 80 points. If you haven't done your replies yet and you've only gotten a grade for your post, your grade on Moodle might look a little bit low, but it'll go up when I grade the replies. Uh, any any other questions about grading, grading policy? I have a video online uh, where I go through the the Prezi and I talk about exactly how the grading policy works and about what I'm expecting, uh, sort of at each grade level. Um, Uh, okay, so uh, one more thing. So I have these um, quizzes. Yeah, so the quizzes, uh, the attendance quizzes. Uh, uh, let me go to lesson two. Actually, let me go to lesson one. So um, oh, I, I don't want to show the actual quiz grades. Uh, so for the lesson one quiz, there's these two Questions, what is the secret word for lecture? What is the secret word for hangout? Uh, for lesson one, I gave these five points each for a maximum of 10 points. Um, in future quizzes, and especially for quiz number two, uh, uh, it's still gonna be the same structure where, oops, no, no, I don't want quiz number two, I want lesson number two, attendance. It's still gonna be the same structure where there's uh, a lecture secret word, and that lecture secret word, you will find it in uh, the lecture that's already online. All right, so in lesson two, uh, I've already Professor, put the lesson two lecture online. Professor, just as a quick question, is it okay if, you, I mean, I'm not sure if the other students would find this more convenient, but um, since there's two different quiz questions, one for the lecture, one for the actual online hangout, is it okay if you can do two different quizzes? Because, um, you know, like for, for me to remember the secret word, I write it down and whatnot, and then to, you know, at, at another point in time, because I have a class right after this, so, to go to that class and then afterwards, like I feel like it's a little inconvenient. Like I could do it. Just as, I mean, if it's if the other students um, find it okay, can you do two quizzes? One for the lecture secret word and one for the um, uh, the online hangout secret word. Um. Uh. Because that way I could just as soon as this lecture, I mean, as soon as online hangout is, is over. I mean, and if, if not, then I could just, you know, write, write it down somewhere. And, but, um, but like if, if there's more than one student saying something, then, you know, it might be a little convenient. Can you not submit individual questions? No, no, uh, no, no. The, uh, you have to submit the quiz as a whole. As a whole? Yeah. Because then after you submit the quiz, it tells you what the answers are. Y yeah. But you can, you can save your quiz in the middle of it. Right. Um, so there's no time limit on the quiz. Oh, so you can save it and just go back to it. And go back to it, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I didn't know they, they, they let, me, let me make sure about that, so.
uh, you know, let's, yeah, so the answer goes away. Uh, Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. So if you oh, just, okay. yeah. So if you, okay, good. I didn't know that. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, Neha for, for saying, yeah, you can go back to the quizzes. So if you type in the first word and hit finish attempt, um, and it'll save your answer and then you can return to that attempt later when you do the other video and then submit them all at once. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So yeah. once you finish the attempt, then you can just go back and it doesn't actually submit it all until you press submit all and finish. Right. And there's no time limit on it. So you can do that until okay. uh, due date. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Look at us learning at this at this uh, online hangout. How how great. Okay. So okay. So uh, yeah. So there's there's going to be two quizzes. Uh, the, the big thing I wanted to um, flag here is that uh, I changed the point values uh, to be more reasonable. So in the first quiz, and I'm going to keep the first quiz the way it was, but the maximum grade was 10 points and it was worth five points each. And from now on, and for all future attendance, uh, it's going to be five attendance points total. Um, and then you get three for doing the secret word in lecture, and then another three for doing the secret word in hangout. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, two, uh, two, so five points total. So three for the lecture hangout, or lecture secret word, and two for the hangout secret word. And I'll go ahead and tell you the hangout secret word right now, which is water. Um, so you can do the attendance quiz two right now with the hangout secret word, which is water. There's a different secret word in the lecture. It's not too hard to find. Uh, I think as the semester goes on, I'm gonna do a little bit more to hide the secret word in the videos and the uh, prezies. Um, for right now, I'm just trying to get everyone on the same page and uh, synced up with the, with the lesson plan. Um, speaking of water, um, if you watch the video where I do the lecture, uh, YouTube had taken down the This Is Water video that I was using. Um, so instead, I've changed, uh, since I recorded the video, I've changed the link uh, and I put it on my private uh, Vimeo account. So you need to use a password. So if you, if you load this, uh, you'll get, it's, that is password protected and the password's water. So you should still be able to watch that video now. Uh, it's a good quality video. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, uh, back to the attendance uh, number two. When I changed the point values for these quizzes, um, I had to delete some of the older quizzes. So I did this yesterday. And when I did yesterday, there were some people in some of the classes, just a couple, just like a handful, uh, but who had taken the lecture secret word because that was already in the Prezi and already done that part of the quiz. Um, and I just wanted to let those people know that I deleted that quiz uh, if you'd already taken it so I could adjust the point values because you can't do that on Moodle if people have already taken the quiz. So if you've already taken the, the attendance quiz, um, and you find it deleted. Uh, that was my fault, I deleted it. So you just have to re-enter the word. You should, shouldn't have a problem doing that. Uh, I think I have one more thing to say about uh, sort of housekeeping stuff, and then we can get into the actual content of the classes. Let me see if I can find something like this uh, really quickly. I should have prepared this a little better. Uh, okay, here, here's, here's uh, a good example. Um, so uh, nothing wrong with Xavier's post here, uh, and I don't want to suggest there's anything wrong with this post. Uh, I just want to focus in on the citations. So, um, so the, the rule for citations is that if you are using something that's in uh, uh, that's in the required readings or the optional readings that, that's given to you in the lecture. You just need to refer to the person's name. So uh, Xavier does this exactly right. He says Herbert Hoover states and gives a quote. And since the reading for this lesson comes from Herbert Hoover, you don't need to give me the exact uh, reference here because I know what you're talking about. Um, no, no, he, he does give a reference, but this reference isn't very helpful. And I want to caution I might even start grading people down for this in the future. Um, so, so, let me, so uh, I, I'm asking for references to be in APA citation uh, format. Um, 
but it doesn't really matter the details of APA format. What matters is the information that you're getting across. There's a few things that you need to know for a citation. You need to know the author, you need to know the title, you need to know the year, and you need to know where it was published, right? What, what website it was published on or what magazine or journal or whatever. Uh, if it was a book, what publisher published the book? Um, you wrote water, and someone wrote water in caps and got it wrong. I might not have put the uh, caps. Um, cases unimportant. I think I put cases unimportant for all of them. Let me let me check the other two classes. Uh, Cases unimportant. Cases unimportant. So water should have worked for every one of those. Unless he spelled water wrong. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, citations. Um, it's important that for citations you have the author, the title, the year, and the publisher, or where it was published. Um, if it's a magazine, you need a little bit more information about exactly what magazine number and so on. Uh, if it's a journal, what journal number. Um, but uh, these kinds of things, uh, so it's good that you put citations at all, but a lot of these citations aren't very helpful. So uh, this last citation is for our textbook. Um, right, so you have the author, the title, place it was published, and the year it was published. Right, that's all the stuff I need to know. Um, this little end bit isn't helping a whole lot. Uh, maybe you're giving page numbers. But these other things don't help anything at all, right? So Titanic Facts, Titanic Facts. Uh, where is this published? Who, who wrote the article? Um, uh, uh, MPND, um, so that's uh, an acronym for no publisher, no date. Uh, if you don't know the publisher and you don't know the date, then you shouldn't be using that as a source. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so, so some of these are wrong. Some of these actually do have publishers and dates. And the author didn't, uh, the, the person who wrote the post just didn't bother looking up what those publisher and dates were. Um, he said when he accessed it, but uh, you know, this article was written at some time, and part of the point of the research is to tell me when, when it was written. So you need to be looking up these things. So uh, whenever you do research, these acronyms, NP and D, should never appear in your citations. Uh, what that shows you is that you haven't actually figured out what the citation is yet. Um, so I think I'm, I, since I'm talking about this a lot in this video, I'm going to I'm going to start marking people down like by one point or two points for having citations with NP and D. Um, you don't need to do a full citation in this way. Um, there are, there were other people, you know, uh, who are doing. Yeah. So okay. So um, in a case like this. You don't need to, uh, you know, you might be using another post, um, but you don't need to give me the full citation. Just give me the link. If, if all you're doing is referring to this one web page, you can just give me the link and that's fine. Um, the full citations will become important when we do the research project in weeks 10 and 11. Um, so I'm setting up for that now. But anytime you do a citation, it should never have the acronyms NP and D in it. If, if it does, it means you haven't actually figured out what the source is. If you don't know the date of a source, if you don't know where it was published, then it's not a reliable source, and you shouldn't be using it in your research. Um, okay. I believe that's all the housekeeping uh, stuff I want. Oh, someone asked a question. Um, if we're just using an internet source, yeah. If you're just if you're just bringing it up in the course of the conversation, you don't need to give me a full citation. Just uh, let me know where you're getting it, so I can. Uh, read your own work. It would be helpful if you could turn it into a full link. If you right, so this I have to actually copy and paste. Um, if you do the extra step uh, of going to the advanced editor and actually uh, you know, doing a hyperlink, you know where you actually go somewhere uh, or whatever. Um, 
so that someone can click on it. Uh, I mean, that helps a little bit. Uh, it's a sort of courtesy of your reader. You don't have to do that, though. Um, a, a link is fine for any, uh, anything that comes up in the course of these kinds of discussions. Uh, if it's serious research, and we're going to have the serious research projects in weeks 10 and 11, then you're going to have to do more than just provide a link. Then you have to actually do a full citation. Uh, but for these, these early discussion forums, you don't have to do that. You just, just drop links. That's fine. Other questions? Other housekeeping questions? So for my uh, assignment, for my 400 plus word assignment, if I want to refer to another website or, uh, and, you know, and whatnot, I could just type in the, the hyperlink uh, instead of actually um, doing an ALA format, or, or do you want it in that sort of format? Um, the link is a lot more helpful than okay than the stuff, right? I mean, this this doesn't tell me anything. This doesn't uh, give me any additional information. the The point of putting citations at the bottom of a article like this is so that your readers can check your work, check where you're getting your information from. A link accomplishes that really well because I can just click on that link and find where you're getting your information from. But these these kinds of citations don't help anything. They're they're not informative. Uh, so. Uh, so don't don't put that at the bottom of your posts. Okay. okay. Yeah. So APA APA has a very specific uh, format, and they have a lot of details specifically about uh, different uh, kinds of sources, right? So if it's a magazine article, you have to do it in a slightly different way. Um, but, but again, the really important things you need to know are the name, the date, the title. And where you got it from. Right? That's what a, that's what another researcher who's looking at your work and wants to check your work needs to know in order to find find the sources. Right. So uh, be doing these citations, and in general, be doing your uh, scholarly work uh, with your readers in mind. Right. What information will help my readers understand what I'm doing? Uh, okay, um, let's let's start talking. Uh, if there's no other questions about uh, the mechanics of the course, why don't we start talking about some of the content? Um, I, I guess I want to uh, just begin by reviewing because you have a you have your two replies due tonight at midnight, and those two replies will be over discussion one. Um, so uh, maybe we can start by just reviewing some of the things we talked about in lesson one. Uh, that you might want to uh, talk about in your replies. Um, quite a lot of students, in fact, I think the majority of students, talked about uh, uh, Hoover's uh, claim that, uh, that the engineers, uh, there's a great liability to being an engineer, um, that uh, there's a special responsibility that engineers face uh, because of their profession. Um, a lot of people commented on this. A lot of people uh, agreed with it. There was quite a few people who disagreed with it. So, um, I don't know, does anyone in chat want to say something that they had, uh, they had written or they had thought about with regard to the Hoover Hoover? Uh, actually, to one of my responses, um, I actually brought up, I mean, I, I was one of the people that agreed with uh, engineering having a, you know, I, I agreed with the Hoover saying that, you know, it's very, uh, what's the what's the what's the word for it? Um, you know, it's very difficult to be an engineer. For for example, uh, I brought up in one of my responses the thing that just happened a few months back with the Samsung uh, Note Seven, right? Like it's such a small thing when it when it comes to constructing something as you know small as a phone uh, could be so you know, could come out so disastrous, you know, something as small as that, like one little error turned those phones into C4 bombs, essentially, you know, so I mean, um, you know, I, I definitely brought that up as, um, you know, kind of relating it to this uh, topic at, at hand. Yeah, no, uh, uh, it's a great thing to talk about. Um, and everyone who was on a plane over the holiday season, which is a lot of people, um, had their pilots, had their air, airplane staff tell them explicitly that you can't have this phone. Uh, uh, maybe we should say a couple of things. I mean, batteries in phones have been getting bigger. Um, every single person, everyone who has a phone has a battery that can explode like that in their phones. And those are all going on planes. Right? We, we go through all the effort of uh, 
the TSA security screenings, and then we walk on the planes with these uh, lithium ion batteries that would explode. I mean, uh, any one of your phones, if you take a nail to the back of it and hammer a nail in it, um, it will explode just like those Note 7s. Um, the problem with the Note 7s is that they were going off without doing anything to them, right? They were just going off by themselves. Uh, uh, and, uh, right, so it disrupts a lot of people's travel plans. Um, the, the PR for Samsung is terrible, right? Having everyone being told that their phones will explode. <laughs> um, that's not good for the company. That's not good for the, uh, uh, for PR. Um, uh, and, and these things have a big impact. It has a big economic impact. Uh, uh, trade relations has impact on people's uh, behavior, buying patterns. Good. Other thoughts, comments? Uh, anyone want to talk about Langdon winners? Uh, do artifacts have politics? Um, I saw some good discussion online. Uh, this is in uh, section 454, uh, 454, uh, Smith. Um, uh, Smith, Smith here, uh, questions, uh, winners claim that artifacts have politics. Uh, and so, so he says, it may seem that artifacts have political agendas, uh, but it's really the individuals who design the artifacts or use the artifacts who are political. Um, I don't completely disagree with winner, the idea of artifacts and politics, but artifacts should not be blamed for what they represent. Uh, their representation is because of the way that they are designed. Um, so the tag of political should be on the individuals who designed it. Um, this, uh, this is a, uh, a good thought. This, uh, th this is the kind of stuff I like. Uh, I mean, I, 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 like Winter, I like Winter's uh, article. I, I like the claim. But I, I really like it when the students disagree and want to push back uh, and sort of challenge some of these claims. And Smith does a good job here. Um, uh, and so, I, so I'm just calling attention to this conversation. There's, there were conversations along these same lines in, in all the discussion forums. Um, so, so here uh, he's saying that maybe, maybe it is the people and not the artifacts that are really political. Um, Xavier responds by talking about the, the wall on the border of Mexico that Trump wants to build. Xavier says, look, I mean, that's, a, that's an explicitly political artifact. Um, the only reason for that thing to exist is uh, for political reasons. This is the kind of political posturing. It was a campaign promise. Right, um, so this kind of political artifact um, I mean, so Donald Trump wants it, so he's, he's a politician. It's a political campaign promise. So, so there's definitely people behind it. But the idea is that you know, uh, Trump's not going to be around forever, but that wall might be there for a long time. Right? And what does that wall represent uh, politically? Um, what, does it wall, what does that wall represent diplomatically uh, in terms of trade relations? Um, all of these things have implications for the way that human social systems organize themselves. Um, good or bad, uh, right? uh, even before you say whether it's good or bad or right and wrong, um, just the mere fact of that object being there has a big impact over what happens around it. Um, uh, so uh, in the lecture, I talk uh, about guns, uh, the, the NRA slogan, guns don't kill people, people kill people. So uh, uh, the claim here is not that guns are good or bad. The claim here is not that it's good or bad to have guns or that people should or shouldn't have guns. Uh, the claim here is just about what happens when you have all these guns around. Um, in the US, there are 90 guns for every 100 people, 100 men, women, and children. Uh, uh, and most of those guns are held by very few people, right? There's a, a, a few uh, men who have lots and lots of guns. Um, uh, so 90 guns for every 100 men, women, and children. Um, in the UK, by comparison, there are about six guns for every person, every man, woman, and child uh, in the UK. Right, so this is like more than 10 times. Was it, it's a, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, 15 times, 15 times, 15 times the number of guns just lying around uh, in the United States. It's no wonder why people get shot by guns wrong, right? There's so much gun violence around, just because we have a lot of guns around. Um, 
Uh, that's what happens when you have a lot of guns around, good or bad. I mean, right, the, the claim is not that uh, guns are good or bad in themselves. The claim is that having a lot of this, these artifacts around changes the way that people behave. If we didn't have all these artifacts around, then there would be a lot less gun violence. Uh, uh, simply because they're there. This is the hard, I mean, it's, it's very hard to be, uh, even for engineers, it's hard to be thinking about the uh, background assumptions that go into our artifacts because uh, we use them so regularly every day that uh, we just never think about it, right? So, you know, uh, where did all the precious uh, metals that went into building the electronics for my mouse come from? I don't think about that at all, right? I think about the $10 that it cost me at Best Buy to buy the mouse, and that's as far as I've thought about where it comes from. But the device itself, right, it's um, full of electronics that were built uh, in factories all over the world um, using resources like rare earth metals that were mined in places all over the world, right? Um, this is a product of global industrial production. Um, and that global industrial production has lots of impacts uh, that I uh, don't think about. I, um, one thing I mentioned in, so I'm sort of rambling now, if people want to stop and interrupt or talk about this, but, uh, Um, how many people know Foxconn? Have heard of Foxconn? I don't, I don't see a lot of videos. Actually, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but there was this one. I mean, it was a while back ago. And I don't remember uh, in detail specifically, but there was a video that I saw once where uh, someone stated that it, it, it's 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 not the fact that we have a lot of a lot of guns is the problem because I remember that there was this one video that I saw in which. Um, there are two people debating the topic on on guns, and you know someone brought up the fact that oh, U.S. Has, very, has a very large population compared to these smaller countries, and then someone said, well, yes, that is true. However, uh, with the combination, like for example, comparing the U.S., uh, you know, and they took a bunch of countries which you know cumulatively added up to the population of the U.S., and we had like I believe it was like a thousand or ten thousand times more deaths by guns. Than, than those countries combined. So I don't necessarily think that it's, uh, I mean, I don't wanna have a strict opinion on this, like whether it's the guns or the, or the people, but I mean, if, if personally, I feel like it's more of like a, a society, as like us as like a whole, are doing something wrong with uh, this situation because it's just not, it's, I don't think it's the fault of the guns, really. It's, it's, just, well, like, it's more of the people, personally, me, but the guns do also have a huge impact in that. Good, good, good comment. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, the goal here is, is not at all to say about whether guns are good or bad. The point is is really just to talk about what is the impact of having them around. How does it change uh, the way that people behave? Um, uh, and how hard it is to think about all the things that go into uh, the reason that we have all these guns around. Right. Um, uh, I mean, Americans like their guns, but we like our guns almost twice as much as any other country. Right? Um, in Switzerland, I think uh, uh, the Swiss government uh, issues a rifle to all its citizens, something like that, and, uh, or all, all, the male, all the male citizens. And, and even there, the, the guns are uh, much fewer than they are in America. Um, yeah, I mean, when you have a lot of guns around, people get shot, right? When you have fire around, people get burned. Uh -huh. And the, the point is not about what people want to do with it. It's about what the artifact itself does, right? Fire burns. And if you're playing with fire, you're going to get burned. Um, uh, if you're playing with guns, someone's going to get shot. And that's, it happens all the time. Um, there, there are definitely responsible gun owners. Um, and then there's also, you know, uh, infants who get a hold of a gun and end up shooting someone accidentally. And that also happens all the time. Um, and the way that you stop that kind of stuff from happening all the time is not having a bunch of guns around, but it's really hard when there's a whole lot of, I mean, they massive dumps of these artifacts all over the place. And not just, not just the production of the artifacts, uh, sort of the industrial production of the artifacts, but also the marketing of the artifacts, getting people to, um, to want to use them, to be afraid so they think they need them, right? Um, uh, uh, Personally, I mean, I mean, I don't want to interrupt here, but I mean, uh, I, 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 I do know that, I mean, obviously different states have different laws, uh, you know, in regards to guns. I mean, like there are some states who are very, very, um, 
you know, secure about it. And there are some states where you can just go to the nearest Walgreens and buy a 50 caliber, you know, hand wrap. I mean, like, it's, it's just very difficult in a sense where the entire country doesn't agree. And like, for example, like, you know, I, I do know that there are, you know, tests, like, like you, you do have to get a license to have a gun. Um, but, you know, are these licenses really assuring people of safety? Because a couple Couple years back, there was a shootout in a preschool that I'm pretty sure that you've all heard of. It was on the news. It was a, it was, you know, a really big occasion when it first happened. Um, a couple years ago, there was a shooting in a preschool. I believe it was like 20 something preschoolers uh, were shot and killed. You know, they were gunned down by an individual who was a licensed, uh, who was a, li a, a licensed uh, gun carrier. You know, he was allowed to have a gun, and he had a lot of them at at, at home. He went to a, a, a school you know shot a bunch of kids and you know and prior to that he went home killed his own mom and committed suicide i mean like i i mean personally we're not putting i think we're not putting enough uh restrictions in place i mean just obviously depending on the state but i mean if you really think about it anyone can just do that i mean it's i feel like we're not strict enough when it comes to that uh good um uh, someone uh, in the chat said that uh, more people are killed by uh, blunt objects and knives than by guns. Uh, looks like this is true. Uh, I'm sorry? I thought I heard someone cut in. But, uh. I mean, you also have to take into consideration that like, our society is highly medicated with drugs which could have psychological effects on the well-being of a person. And that might person might have a, an arm under their, a license for an arm also. Yeah. That, uh, sorry, I, I, don't, I don't want to interrupt, but I mean, that, that might be true, but um, you know, when it comes down to it, why is that person given a license to carry a weapon? Uh, you know, considering the fact that it is known that they have uh, you know, it's on record that they're taking medication for some sort of sickness and this, you know, this medication can have serious uh, side effects. Like, is it really something that, that we're not thinking about? Like, it, it, I mean, if, if this medication is as dire as, as you know, it sounds really, then um, why is this person still allowed to carry a firearm in such a situation? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, Brian. And as you pointed out earlier, uh, the laws for these things are different on a state by state basis, and sometimes even by county for county, right? Uh, uh, so, so having so talking about this in any general terms is is very difficult. But but I, I think what we've already said, and this has been a good conversation. Uh, what we've already said sort of gets the point on the table that it's not just about it's not just about uh, you know the the bad guy with the gun who wants to do something evil. Um, there's also a lot of other considerations that go into uh, how this gun violence occurs, right? The, the uh, medications that people are on and the background checks that uh, states do and all the political and financial and uh, psychological issues that go into all of these things and they all intersect, right? So it's very nice, it's very sort of uh, pleasant and tidy to think that when someone kills someone with a gun, it's because they're a bad guy and that they have a bad intention and they do a bad thing. Um, you know, sometimes it actually happens, but sometimes it's not just the, the bad guy uh, with a bad intention. Sometimes it's a lot of people who don't have bad intentions, but are within a system that you know, pushes them one way or another, and then bad things happen. And not because anyone wanted those bad things to happen, but just because they do. Um, and it's not, not, not to be rude or anything, but I don't necessarily think that intentions matter. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that the day before that person, you know, that I was talking about, you know, shot and killed 20 something preschoolers. I didn't think that he intended to do that when he purchased the guns, but, um, at the end of the day, that's what, what, what the result was, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, I'm pretty sure he didn't walk into a store and say, you know what, this would be great for annihilating a room full of children. No, he didn't say that, you know, that wasn't his, his intention, but I mean, like, I, I, yes, I do know that this is a very drastic situation. I mean, you know, this, this is a very uh, uh, exaggerated situation, but at the end of the day, it does happen. Like, it, it did result in the lives of, you know, these kids and also in the countless other situations that this has happened, you know, like maybe not with 20 something or so kids, but with one or two individuals here and there in every state, you know? Yeah, I mean, 
uh, I, uh, I, I didn't mean to suggest that there aren't bad people with bad intentions. Um, I, I, I meant to suggest that sometimes the artifacts put us in situations where bad things happen even when people don't have bad intentions, right? The infant who you know, accidentally grabs a gun and shoots someone, the infant doesn't, has no idea what they're doing, right? It's not, uh, it's not trying to do something bad. It doesn't know what it's doing in the first place, um, but because it has access to the gun, it can uh, have uh, these bad consequences, right? Simply because of the infrastructure around it. Um, so to, to maybe put a, a, a finer point on this idea of how intentions, how the intentions of people aren't what, what drives the politics of these artifacts. Um, let, me, let me give another example. Let me give the Foxconn example. So Foxconn, if you haven't heard of uh, uh, Foxconn, um, Foxconn is a uh, uh, manufacturing company um, in China. Uh, uh, and they produce almost all of the electronics that you use. So uh, Apple, all iPhones and iPads get made through Foxconn. Uh, Blackberry, I don't think anyone uses Blackberry anymore, do they? Um, yeah, all the iPods, um, all the Kindles and any other sort of tablet, almost every other tablet, anything Nintendo or Sony, uh, uh, Xbox One, um, all this stuff. Any of these customers, if you have an electronics product from any of these uh, companies, um, Microsoft, Nokia, Toshiba, Intel, um, Hewlett Packard, Dell, Google, Blackberry, right? So uh, all of these electronics are made in Foxconn plants. Um, so Foxconn is a manufacturing company in China where they have these massive warehouses uh, that uh, people work. This is high-end electronics. These are not sweatshops. You can't uh, produce high-end electronics in sweatshops. Uh, you need to have uh, clean working conditions. Um, but uh, uh, these workers, uh, I mean, they're not paid uh, at the same rate as American workers, and that's why everyone makes their stuff in China. Um, um, but they're also, for a long time, weren't paid well in general. Uh, these plants in China typically are out in the country, and what would happen is that someone who lives in the uh, city would go out to the country uh, and work at the Foxconn plant for a few months at a time, in six months, in the summer, right before the holiday season, right? So they're making all the stuff that we're going to buy uh, come the holidays. I mean, they'll go out there for months at a time, send their money back to their family in the city. Um, the Foxconn plants would not only have the manufacturing floor where they actually build the stuff, but in one wing of the plant, there'll be the dorms where everyone stays. In another wing, there'll be the commissary where you buy your uh, food and stuff. Um, and uh, workers who would go to the Foxconn plant would you know, live in the dorms and work on the floor and go to the commissary and stay and live those whole you know, three or six or eight months in the same building without going outside. Um, uh, you know, uh, not getting paid very well uh, and working very hard to produce all the electronics uh, for us in the West. So these conditions, these working conditions, uh, weren't great and in, uh, uh, in 2010 um, and the years around 2010, uh, there were a rash of suicides uh, in 2010, in particular, there were uh, 18 people committed suicide uh, at the Foxconn plants. Yeah, um, someone said they have to go. Uh, please don't feel bad uh, leaving, coming. Um, I know a lot of people have other classes scheduled at this time. Uh, so uh, I'm recording it and I'm going to put it all up on the website so you can watch it at your, at your convenience. Uh, I'm just here in case people who do have time I want to come and ask questions and get into some discussion uh, like we've been having. Um, yeah, okay, so, uh, so Foxconn, uh, there were these rash of suicides, 18 suicides, uh, uh, workers jump, uh, jumping off the factory ceilings. So, um, so, th so there's these, uh, these factories and all these people jumping off uh, the roof and Foxconn's response to this, their original response in 2010, was to set up netting around all their buildings to catch people from jumping off the roof. Right, so these are the anti-suicide nets uh, that they are forced to put around their buildings in China uh, because the workers keep throwing themselves off the building. Would it be safe to say that this entails like a new form of slavery? Uh, so, um, I mean, it, so it's, it's difficult, uh, to say it, it's difficult to say, so 
Um, slavery is ownership of people, um, uh, and that's not quite what's going on here. Right? They're paying these people. They're not paying them great. They're having them work in pretty miserable conditions, and it's driving them to suicide. But they're not owned and beaten like slaves. So this isn't quite slavery. Um, not that slavery. Uh, there are forms of slavery that still exist uh, where people get shipped off and uh, do domestic work. Um, it's, slavery is still a problem. This isn't quite slavery. This, um, you might call it something like wage servitude. Right? Right? The point is that right, they're forced into these bad working conditions because that's where all the money is. And the reason that's where all the money is is because us in the West are paying lots of money for these iPhones. Right? And you know, we're paying $700 for a new iPhone. Uh, if we actually paid the workers who built that iPhone a living wage, you know, maybe our iPhone would cost $900, but we don't want to pay that extra $150 or $200. That's, that's too much. That's too expensive. Um, so, uh, so we demand that the prices are cheap, and the only way that uh, manufacturers can meet those prices is by having these kinds of working conditions. So all of us here in the West, right, uh, I don't think anyone who has an iPhone deliberately wants Chinese workers to commit suicide. I don't think that's anyone's intention, uh, but by uh, engaging in this kind of uh, consumer electronics consumption, um, we put the world economy in a position where workers are being driven to suicide. So even though we don't have this intention, um, everyone who's buying electronics from all these companies is contributing to exactly this problem. Now, uh, so this was a, this is something that happened in 2010, and it, it was a big deal at the time, and in the years after that, uh, there, you know, there was a lot of protests of Apple products and so on, and there's been a lot of pressure on Foxconn to reform its ways to uh, improve its working conditions, to pay its workers better, and so on. And as far as I know, these problems aren't as bad there anymore. Um, but it's a good example of how uh, people can unwittingly contribute to um, uh, a bad system, a system that is bad for people, even though none of the, no one wants those bad things to happen, and if, uh, but they still contribute to it nevertheless. Uh, so someone asks, uh, were the nets the sole solution to the problem, or did they tackle the larger underlying issues? Uh, yes, yeah, so this wasn't the sole solution to the problem. Uh, this, was the, this was the immediate solution to the problem. Right? So uh, once word got out that these things were happening, the first thing that they did was put up these nets. Um, uh, and it sort of stayed that way for a while until Western media started catching on. And then Western media uh, journalists would go out to the Foxconn plants and start interviewing people. They ended up finding a lot of underage workers too, uh, 14, 15 year old kids uh, working in these plants. Um, by the way, uh, at the time, like none of the people who worked at these plants would ever have enough money to buy an iPhone or even use an iPhone. They had no idea what they were building. They were just uh, producing it and then it's shipped, shipped across the globe for us. So uh, they put up the nets. Um, they sort of kept quiet about it until the journal, until the news media found out, and then the journalists went over there uh, and figured out how bad the working conditions were. Um, and that resulted in a lot of pressure on Western companies like Apple. There was a lot of protests of Apple. Um, and then uh, because of the pressure on Apple, Apple was able to use its negotiation with Foxconn to help try to improve the plants over there. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the Nets weren't the only solution. They were the initial solution, and it really took uh, sort of an outraged public to demand that these workers be treated better before things started to change. Um, uh, um, this, kind of, this kind of reputation isn't very good for Foxconn. So uh, over the last few years, you see people, uh, Foxconn has been putting out these sort of PR stunts where they have all their workers wear I love Foxconn shirts and then smile into the camera. Um, yeah, this is what a Foxconn plant would look like. Is there a line where someone is not participating in Foxconn? Like you said, people with iPod, iPhones are participating in this, which is confusing. Um, yeah, I mean, people with iPhones are contributing to this problem, and not just iPhones, but people with any of, any of the electronics products that are built by any of those companies. Let me pull up the list again. Um, this isn't every company. So uh, it's, Samsung, for instance, is not on this list. Samsung is a, a South Korean company, uh, and they have their own manufacturing plants in South Korea uh, that make exploding foams. <laughs> um, 
but these are the thoughts sometimes. If you if you own a Nintendo Wii or a Sony PlayStation or an Xbox uh, One, um, then you you own a device that was built in one of these plants with working conditions like that. Right, and so uh, your consumption of these products is what helps sustain these working conditions for these workers. Uh, so Enron asks, well, does that mean that we shouldn't use electronics anymore to stop such unethical occurrences? Uh, uh, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, I have electronics. I'm, I'm talking to you right now on a Lenovo laptop. I, this, is, this is a school-issued laptop. It's not my personal one. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm totally pro-electronics, uh, and I'm not telling you that you shouldn't be using those electronics. What I'm saying is, uh, I'm, I'm saying a couple of things. One is that these systems are really big and really complicated, and it's very hard to see their structure uh, from just being an end user. Uh, like I said, you know, when I buy the mouse at Best Buy, I'm thinking of the $10 I spend on it, and that's as far as I think about where it comes from. And I don't think about the global manufacturing process that produces it or the mining process that produces all the resources that go into making it, right? Or all the international politics that uh, is a part of that, uh, that process. I'm not telling you that you should stop buying electronics. What, what I'm suggesting is, that, uh, to, is to think a little bit about these structures and how they influence the organization of society, right? Uh, how it's these kinds of structures that produce the world that we live in. So would you say that, would it be safe to say that the future of industry and technology should be more localized to serve its region or its community instead of thinking of a larger globalized manner? Because a larger globalized manner is producing what, what you're describing in like Foxconn. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, th that's, that's maybe one way to go about it. Um, another way to go about it is maybe uh, instead of, it's, you know, it's fine to do global production, but maybe pay all the workers a living wage so that they don't, so they're not driven to suicide. And, you know, maybe if uh, Chinese manufacturers actually have to pay their workers at the same rates that the U.S. manufacturers have to pay their workers, then, then it stops being cost effective to ship all this manufacturing overseas. Right? So, right, so not, not because things should be local, but maybe it's just, it's just it, the, the reason that it's cheaper to ship, ship stuff off to China is because China doesn't have all the regulations protecting its workers that we do in the United States. And so, instead of making sure that workers are taken care of, we'd rather get the cheap products and use workers who aren't being taken care of. Right? So, so one way of uh, dealing with this is saying, no, we should make all this stuff locally. But another way of dealing with this is saying, no, maybe we should be taking care of our workers, whether they're in China or America. Um, uh, right? I mean, because uh, if, if we stop using China to manufacture these jobs, then all the workers in China won't have work either. Right? So you screw people over either way. What you need to do is actually pay the workers a living wage so that they're not driven to suicide, right? So they don't, uh, so they're not completely dependent on the system. What that what that means for the end users is that your electronics end up being more expensive. If you're actually paying people a decent wage for the work they do, then maybe my mouse doesn't cost ten dollars; it costs fifteen dollars, um, and I have to eat that extra five dollars as a as a consumer. But maybe uh, five dollars is not so much to pay to know that I'm not driving people to suicide. Um, uh, uh, throughout this course, my point is not to convince you of any particular, that any particular thing is right or wrong or that you should do or do any particular thing. My goal is just to make you think more broadly about what's going on in all these systems um, and, and what our relationship is to these systems and how hard the choices are to make. Right? I mean, I don't want people to die, but at the other, on the other hand, I, I do kind of like my iPhone. Uh, and so how, how do I balance those two desires? Um, that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, so, so one of the points here was about how big and complex these systems are and how difficult it is to understand what you're doing in them. Um, the other part of this is about how intentions aren't really what's driving this, right? So uh, it, it's not my intention as a consumer to drive Chinese workers to suicide, but it happens because of my consumption habits, right? So um, uh, even though it's not my intention, I still play a role in all these negative consequences, uh, right? This is part of what it means to say that the artifacts have politics. It's not just the bad intentions of the users of the artifacts. So, I mean, sometimes users have bad intentions, but
but it's not always the case that bad things happen because of bad people. Sometimes it's because of bad systems, and even if all the people in that system have the best of intentions, it still works out poorly. The best example of this uh, uh, I gave uh, in the optional readings for lesson one, which was the, paragon, uh, the parable of the polygons. I didn't actually talk about this in the lesson, but um, so the, the point of this demonstration, and I strongly encourage you to go through it. It's, it's very fun and uh, sort of simple. So uh, there's two shapes in the society. There's the triangles and the squares. Um, and the idea is that triangles and squares um, have a slight bias for the composition of their population. But the thing is that their bias is towards diversity. So triangles and squares like a diverse population. They like to be surrounded by an equal mix of triangles and squares. So the triangle here is unhappy because it's surrounded by squares. But notice that some of these squares are also unhappy because they're also surrounded by squares. So it's not that squares only like squares and triangles only like triangles. Um, all of the creatures uh, in this world, they like diversity. But when you put a lot of creatures that like diversity together um, in a board, right, depending on how that balance works, um, when they try to satisfy their need for diversity, they end up creating a segregated society. Um, let me show, let me show it down here. Right, so you can, you can tell how much do you want your neighbors to be like you. If I want exactly 50% of my neighbors like me, right? So it's an even mix uh, on both sides. Um, so they're going to start sorting out so that they get to reach that even mix. Right? So even if all of the all the creatures in this world like a completely diverse society, they end up assembling themselves in a way that's even more segregated. Right? So, so the point is that there's no racist in this society, right? Everyone wants to be diverse, but because of the way that their biases interact, they end up creating a structure that is strongly segregated, even though that's not what any of them wanted. Right? This is how these complex systems end up syncing up to have larger effects that none of the individuals in the system ever wanted. And I mean, this is very common in engineering projects, right? Uh, the people who built the telephone or the cell phone, uh, they didn't have in mind uh, the way that we use these technologies today. They were thinking about completely other things. When the telephone was originally built, um, they were thinking mostly about business and government applications. Um, they weren't thinking that people would want to use it to chat with their friends. It hadn't even occurred to them that that would be something that people would want to use it for. They were thinking it would have you know, business and government applications. And it turns out that when you give people a telephone, they like just chatting on it. And uh, it, that, that surprised all the people who designed the thing. Um, and, it, and it changed the way that we use the technology. And, change, and that technology ends up changing the world. Despite, despite the fact that it was never anyone's intention, that it was not part of the design, that's not what we went in to do, but it's what ended up happening anyway. Uh, comments, questions? I, I guess I, I wanna just move on next to just uh, talk uh, briefly about some of the articles in lesson two. Um, we'll do some more in-depth discussion next week, but I just wanted to make sure you introduce these if you haven't watched the video already. Um, and so you can get started uh, on this week's lesson also. So lesson two is about the scope of ethical consideration. It's about what are the things that we consider when we're uh, thinking about the values in engineering? You know, uh, whose perspectives are considered? What, what values? Um, do some people's values matter more than others? Somebody have a comment? Was there a comment in the chat? Uh, so scope of ethical consideration, um, I uh, go over all these articles in the um, lecture video, but I just wanted to uh, call attention to the Challenger disaster uh, real quickly. Um, um, because Challenger disaster has, uh, I think the best, the best uh, example, like concrete, real historical case study example of uh, how how difficult engineering ethics is. So, um, uh, so some of you already know details of this. If you don't know, just really briefly, and I say more about this in the lecture. But uh, it was 1986. Um, so that's the Challenger explosion. Challenger is this uh, rocket ship. Uh, it's uh, contained. These are the astronauts on the spaceship, including uh, Chris McAuliffe, who was a kindergarten teacher 
on and one is the first teacher uh, supposed to be in space first civilian uh, that was uh, scheduled to go to space um, but she didn't make it there because the ship blew up uh, the rockets blew up on um, about 70 seconds into the launch um, it blew up some people mentioned this in the forums it blew up because of failed o-rings uh, uh, in the uh, rocket uh, that was uh, leaking exhaust and it leaked enough exhaust that the thing ended up uh, exploding and part of the reason these o-rings failed was because uh, it was too cold uh, the night before the launch, it was so cold that it was below operating temperature um, where uh, the O-rings uh, failed. So too cold the night before, O-rings failed, they launch anyway, um, and then it explodes about 70 seconds into the launch. Yeah, so Tim says in the chat it was a known issue, and that's right. Um, it was a known issue. The engineers uh, who uh, were responsible for the rocket, they knew that those O-rings were not reliable. Um, they also knew that it was going to be very cold that morning, um, and so that they... Uh, uh, the engineers decided and unanimously decided the engineers uh, gave their recommendation that they do not go through with this launch, that they postpone the launch until it's a warmer date um, and they know that it will be successful. Now, this recommendation for postponement happened after a series of postponements had already occurred, right? So this is a, you know, the, another delay on the back of a long string of delays. Um, and Almost everyone else in NASA and the uh, and their business partners, their contra uh, contractors, um, they were fed up with these delays. They just wanted this to launch the rocket as soon as possible. Uh, Morton Thiokol, who's the rocket constructor, um, Morton Thiokol uh, was up for contract negotiations with NASA, um, and if they got a successful launch, then the contract negotiations go a lot more smoothly. So they wanted this launch happen to happen as soon as possible. Um, on the day of the launch. Uh, President Reagan was uh, scheduled to give his State of the Union address later that evening. Um, so, uh, so there was political pressure uh, for them to get this launch successfully off, so that way Reagan would have something to gloat about in his speech. So they, were, they were getting political pressure from the President of the United States, or they were getting financial pressure for these, these contracts. Um, but the engineers were saying that there was a faulty part that they couldn't rely on and they should postpone. Um, the night before the launch, they have a uh, phone co conference call between NASA and Martin Thiokol uh, trying to decide whether they go through with the launch. Um, the uh, Vice President of Engineering, uh, uh, Vice President of Engineering is Bob Lund, and he's hearing from his engineers that they should postpone the launch. Um, but the Senior Vice President of Martin Thiokol, uh, Jerry Mason, um, uh, his react so he's, he's the Vice President of the entire company, his manager, um, and he says that this recommendation to postpone is ridiculous, it's absurd, it's bad for the company. And he leans over during this meeting when they're deciding whether to do the launch, he leans over to Bob Lund, the engineer, and he tells him, look, I want you to take your engineering hat off and put on your management hat. Right? Stop thinking about this like an engineer. I mean, not that the engineer's concerns aren't valid, but there's other concerns here. There's management concerns. There's concerns about the finances. There's concerns about the political pressure. And uh, right, so the senior vice president asks the engineer, the new engineering vice president, to stop thinking like an engineer and start thinking like a manager. And uh, and he does so, right? Uh, even though his engineers are telling him not to launch, he he takes off his engineering hat, puts on his manager hat, and approves the launch. So does everyone else, and they go through with the launch, and then disaster strikes. Right, um, it's a great story. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing that's engineering ethics legend, uh, uh, sort of myth mythologized by now. Um, and the reason it's mythologized is because it makes exactly the right point that the the it's not just about whether you're a good or a bad person. It's about what particular perspective are you bringing to an issue, and one and the same person might be bringing lots of different perspectives. Right, uh, Vice President of Engineering Bob Lund. He's an engineer, he's hearing from his engineers, and he knows how to think like an engineer. But he's also a vice president, he's also a manager, and he knows how to think like a manager. And these two roles have different concerns, they have different values, um, they have different uh, goals, uh, and being in one perspective or other might change the decision that you make. In this case, it, it changed the decision, and it went from uh, postponement to disaster, with just that one change of decision. And, and right, this isn't two different perspectives from two different people. This is one and the same person who has these two different perspectives that he's juggling between. 
This is the challenge of engineering ethics. It's not about doing the right thing or being a good person. You, most of you know how to do that already, and I can't teach you if you don't know how to do that. The challenge is figuring out which perspectives you want to actually defend, because you can, you, you, uh, you can, you do occupy many perspectives, and you can defend uh, some or all of those. Sometimes they're incompatible, but sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to make a choice uh, between one perspective or the other, between two values, each of which you hold dear. Right? So not not between right and wrong, but between two things you think are right. Um, right. Uh, I mean. Right. Managers aren't bad people, but managers have different concerns than the engineers. And when Bob Lund makes a decision as a manager, he's going to make a different decision than he would make when he's thinking like an engineer. And that difference matters. That difference can be the matter of life and death. Um, so the point here is not thinking about just what is right and wrong, but thinking about which perspectives are you bringing to an issue? How are you making your decisions? Right? Which hats are you wearing? Which roles are you playing? Um, and and how do those roles conflict? And so uh, if we go back to the Foxconn example, um, on the one hand, I like to think of myself as a good person uh, who doesn't drive people to suicide. On the other hand, I like to have a cell phone around me at all times. Right, these, right, this isn't the difference between right and wrong. This is the difference between two things that I think are right, right? two things that I value. The question is, which do I value more? How do I balance these two values? Uh, Axels says, Professor, did, in the end, did all the engineers end up agreeing to approve the launch? No, the engineers uh, voted to postpone the launch and the management overrode the suggestion of the engineers. Um, right, so the final decision was a management decision. It was an engineering decision. They took the engineering considerations into account, but in the end, it was a management decision that made the final call. Uh, maybe to put, uh, uh, yeah, so maybe to put a, a fine point on this, so last year was the 30th anniversary of the Chandra explosion, and NPR ran uh, this article with Bob Ebling. They talk about Bob Ebling in your textbook. Uh, Bob Ebling was uh, one of the uh, more Thiokol contractors um, working with NASA on this launch. Uh, uh, Bob Evling, he knew about the O-ring failure. Um, he was the one who was pushing hardest uh, to take this failure seriously uh, so that everyone actually did take it seriously. Um, he was the one who spearheaded the, the call for postponement, even though it was very politically unpopular. He was the guy who uh, got all the engineers on his side to say, no, that we shouldn't launch. And then they ended up launching anyway. And for 30 years, this guy blamed himself. He thought he could have done more. You know, if he'd only done more, maybe they would have listened to him more. For 30 years, this guy uh, blamed himself for this launch. He was, he was an engineer um, uh, that did as much as he could within that system to try to get this launch delayed, and he wasn't successful. Um, and so, so in this interview, he talks about like, still like, waking up at night in a panic and you know, feeling bad about it. Uh, so this is on the 30th anniversary back in January of last year. Uh, immediately after this, um, uh, uh, immediately after this, like the internet does with kind of stories, there was this big out outpouring of gratitude and uh, 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 appreciation, respect for Bob Ebling and the work that he did do, and a lot of people telling him, "Look, it wasn't it wasn't your fault. Don't blame yourself. It wasn't your fault." Uh, and then, uh, just a few days after that, he died. Um, Uh, like he, he expressed his gratitude uh, to everyone who told him it wasn't his fault, um, and then he died a few days later. This is one of those things, so, sort of like the um, the Carrie Fisher thing, where, where she dies and then her mom dies a few days later. Um, Bob Ebling has been carrying around this uh, this burden, this albatross around his neck for thirty years. I um, mean, he finally gets to sort of get it off his chest on the thirtieth anniversary, and then he gets this big outpouring of gratitude from the internet. It finally sort of frees him of this burden, and he dies just a few days later. I sort of, sort of nice and romantic. Uh, so Axel says, um, 
this is a, a little bit of conversation thing. Emron points out that Feynman was right to get upset, upset towards NASA. I think mean, that's exactly right. And there's some video of Feynman basically yelling at NASA for being completely uh, unprepared, unprofessional, making a terrible decision, not listening to the science, like just being bad scientists. Um, so it's kind of fun to see Feynman go off on it. Uh, Emron says, uh, the code of ethics says the most important thing is safety, but the managers decided otherwise. Uh, were the volunteers aware of the manager's ability to override, overrule the code of ethics? Um, are there different codes of ethics for managers as it appears otherwise? It's an excellent question. Uh, there's a couple of things to say. Usually managers take business ethics classes. Um, in, in business ethics classes, the, um, the issue isn't so much about safety as it is about uh, cheating, um, sort of unfair business practices, insider trading, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, dishonest marketing, that kind of stuff. Um, managers don't think a whole lot about the safety issues because that's an engineering concern, right? That's what the engineers are supposed to be thinking about. Um, but I mean, this, this shows the problem that if a business is making a decision based on management concerns and they're not really listening to their engineers, mm -hmm. you can have these big uh, safety problems. Um, so yes, were the volunteers aware of the manager's ability to overrule the code of ethics? By volunteers, you mean the astronauts? Um, the astronauts uh, knew of the problem and the only, the only way that uh, an organization like that can work um, is if the astronauts completely trust the people uh, mm -hmm. who, who are taking care of them, right? Completely trust the engineers, completely trust NASA. Uh, and, I mean, and this is exactly why this is a problem, right? Because uh, when the Challenger exploded, it showed that you really couldn't trust them, that they were making decisions that weren't in the best interests of their astronauts. And in fact, this happened again, right? So the Challenger explodes in 86. Um, in 2003, the Columbia uh, explodes, uh, and the Columbia explodes on re-entry, mm -hmm. and it's, it's an even sadder case because uh, it was a foam insulation fell off of the Columbia when they, when they did the launch, and when they got up out into space, and they realized all this foam insulation had fallen off, and they were like, well, there's nothing we can do about it up here, so we got to go back in anyway, and so they, knowing that the ship is unsafe, they uh, go back in, and it explodes on re-entry. Um, it's precisely because of these massive safety problems that we don't have shuttle launches anymore. It's, it's too costly in terms of life, in terms of uh, uh, public uh, support. Right? When the public sees these big explosions, they don't, they don't trust NASA anymore. And the same thing goes for engineers. This is why the code of ethics for engineers is so uh, focused on safety. Not, just, not simply because safety matters, although safety matters a whole lot, but uh, failures of safety have an impact for the entire engineering profession. Uh, the way the public thinks about engineering projects, the extent to which the public will trust an engineering project, uh, depends on having successful engineering projects that, are, that don't break down. But so if you build a bridge and that bridge crumbles just a few years later, no one's gonna want you to build a bridge again, and you know, maybe the public won't trust the next bridge that comes up to replace it. All right, so it's not just about the safety of that one thing, but it's about thinking about uh, all the future engineers who depend on the, uh, the reputation of the, of the discipline. Except the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. I, uh, yes, uh, they wanted him to rebuild the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, that's correct. Um, I guess it's also worth saying that Tacoma Narrows Bridge is pretty, pretty long time ago. It's in the 1920s, I think. Um, maybe after that. Uh, but, um, uh, our engineering knowledge at the time wasn't as great as, as it is now. Is there a comment? There's another quote. So uh, Axel says, uh, so I don't know the whole story, but I'm curious because I understand that there was more in play for the VP engineer to think about. Um, maybe the other engineers could have said something to the astronauts themselves so they knew that there was something wrong uh, uh, and they don't think they should go through with it. Maybe just a thought on the perspective of the other engineers uh, who didn't agree. Um, that's an excellent point. Um, what Axel is suggesting is a kind of whistleblowing. Um, and we'll, we have a whole lesson on whistleblowing. Uh, whistleblowing is just making an issue known outside of the proper channels. So. Whistleblowing isn't always about telling the press or telling the public. Um, sometimes it's just about telling another department that you wouldn't be telling otherwise. Um, so uh, the, the, you know, the chain of command here is that the engineers report to the VP of engineering and the VP of engineering makes the management decision with all the rest of the, the managers. Um, 
So if the engineers were to go outside of this chain of command and talk directly to the astronauts, um, this is, uh, I mean, it's a violation of the chain of command. Uh, in the military, the chain of command is, is like, it's all powerful, right? Uh, the only reason that the system works is because there's a proper hierarchy about who's in charge of who. And if the engineers are going to the astronauts, you're going you know, across, uh, across the business, um, that could sow dissent. I mean, so, uh, uh, making the astronauts more nervous about the safety of the uh, launch might not be the best way of getting something to happen. I mean, in some sense, the, the astronauts are just cargo, and they sort of at the whims of what the engineers tell them to do. Uh, the, once the astronauts get into space, then they have stuff to do, but until they get into space, they're just sitting there, uh, and they have to trust uh, all the engineers and all the uh, technicians around them to actually do their job well. So telling the astronauts, would that have accomplished something? I mean, I don't know, uh, maybe. Um, you know, maybe they should have been talking to the, the VP more. Maybe uh, Bob Lund should have been more uh, concerned about what the engineer says, and has, should have been less concerned about putting on his engineering hat. I mean, uh, putting on his manager hat. I mean, right, there's, there's sort of lots of steps in this process where maybe something could have been done different. And I, I take it for granted that no one involved at all wanted those, in, uh, those astronauts to die, right? No one intended for that spaceship to blow up. No one wanted those astronauts to die. Everyone thought it was a tragedy, right? No one had the intention for this bad thing to happen. But it happened nonetheless, and you can see the bad decisions that went into making it happen, even though no one had the bad intentions in the first place. Yeah, it's, if it, since it's not the astronauts' calls on whether to launch, telling them about it might just, might just make things worse, not better. I mean, and this is, this is why this is difficult, right? So uh, if you're an engineer working for NASA, but you're not in management, you're not anywhere close to management, you just know that this, this product is faulty, right? that there's something dangerous. Uh, what do you do? How far do you go to make the case that it's dangerous? Um, are you willing to put your career on the line? Um, are you willing to risk the possibility of getting fired for pushing this thing? Because on the other hand, if you don't, uh, maybe you end up like Bob Ebling, who uh, is anxious about this for 30 years, right? lives, lives with the guilt of it for 30 years thinking that he could have done more. It's some heavy stuff. Um, think about it, uh, watch the video, do the readings, uh, think about these kinds of issues. Um, the Women in STEM discussion is also really interesting. Uh, maybe we'll start talking about that in uh, the online hangout next week. Uh, Axel says, it was just a difference in perspective that led to the choices uh, being made and one thing led to another. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. And yeah, so uh, the goal of this class is not to teach you about the difference between right and wrong. The goal of this class is to get you to understand what perspective you have and what it brings to a situation and you know, what you can do with it, why having that perspective matters. Um, because you know, uh, you, in, in engineering ethics courses like this, we go over these big major disasters, these big national disasters you know, where lots of people die or it's, it's a big, it's a big tragedy. Um, chances are you, you won't be involved with a project that works at that scale. You, maybe you will, it's possible that you will, but uh, maybe you won't, maybe you only work with small, small scale things. Um, you never are in a position to make life or death decisions at this, at this level. Um, but even, even the everyday work decisions that you make still depend on the perspective that you're bringing uh, and, and the values that it represents. So, uh, so be thinking about what perspective you have. Uh, Thanks everyone for the discussion, the discussion about uh, uh, guns. Um, it was all very good. Um, uh, hopefully we come back next week and do some more like this. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. See you everyone.